I'm talking this evening about morphic resonance, which is one of my favourite themes, but I haven't talked about it here at Hollyhock for um, at least 10 years, uh, because I've talked about other things. Um, but some of you are familiar with the idea, some of you are not. So first I'm going to give a very brief summary of the idea of morphic resonance, then I'm going to talk about some of its implications, particularly implications that affect us you know, as in our lives and our normal lives. Morphic resonance is the idea that there's a kind of memory in nature. The so-called laws of nature are more like habits. Uh, each species has a collective memory. And in the human realm, that collective memory is more or less what Jung called the collective unconscious. And this process of memory works through resonance from the past to the present on the basis of similarity, like on like, across space and time. Um, this theory has many, many implications. Perhaps one of the most startling is that our own memories are not stored inside our brains, as commonly assumed, but rather we tune into them. Our brains are more like tuning systems uh, more like TVs than like video recorders. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment, but this is just to give the brief overview. Now, the idea of morphic resonance, memory and nature is rather shocking in Western science. Indeed, it's been proclaimed a heresy by some scientific authorities um, because it goes against the usual assumptions of Western science, um, which are that nature is governed by fixed eternal laws. And this idea of fixed eternal laws goes back a very long way. Pythagoras in ancient Greece had the idea that there was an eternal reality which this reality reflects. In fact, all the ancient Greek philosophers thought that there was an eternal reality that this changing world was a reflection of. They had different theories about what the eternal reality was, and Pythagoras thought it was mathematics, uh, numbers, ratios, proportions, harmonies. And um, he thought that the mathematical realm was the truly real realm, and everything in this world was a reflection of it. Now, Plato generalized Pythagoras's idea to say it's not just mathematics that's eternal, it's um, the uh, whole, all the realm of forms and ideas, the shapes of everything, red cedars, you know, horses, cats, hedgehogs, all these, uh, uh, everything in nature has an eternal form or archetype in a transcendent realm beyond space and time, the realm of platonic forms or ideas. And in, in the beginning of the 17th century, when the scientific revolution got going, the founding fathers of modern science were all um, believers in this kind of platonic Pythagorean cosmology. They thought that the laws of nature were mathematical, that they were discovering the mathematical principles of nature which were ideas in the mind of God, that for them God was a mathematician. Uh, mathematicians very much like the idea that God's a mathematician because it means that they're the closest of all humans to the divine and uh, also automatically a kind of priesthood because most of us don't understand much maths and, and that means that mathematicians have this privileged role in our society. So they all like that idea even right, right up to the present. Uh, your most hard-nosed atheistic physicist uh, is usually a secret Platonist. Um, so the idea that all the laws of nature are eternal, that nature is governed by fixed laws, is really built into the foundations of Western thought. It's not built into the foundations of Eastern thought. In Hinduism and Buddhism, it's taken for granted there's a kind of memory in nature. And when I came up with the idea of morphic resonance, I was working at Cambridge doing research on plant development. Um, and I came up with this idea uh, in terms of understanding the inheritance of form in plants and animals. Um, I didn't come up to, with it by studying Eastern philosophy. I hadn't studied Eastern philosophy. But when I uh, then later went to work in India, I spent seven years in India, uh, when I explained morphic resonance to my Hindu friends, 
Uh, most of them were deeply unimpressed. They said, oh, this is an ancient idea. Rishis said this thousands of years ago and stuff. And, and they, they just thought, what's new? Uh, you know, we've heard all this before. Whereas in Cambridge, where I, when I talked about the idea, there was shock and horror in, in the scientific realm. Now, I think that actually, uh, although Western science has been based on this eternal law principle, it's in a state of crisis. Until 1966, most scientists thought the universe was eternal, and having an eternal universe governed by eternal laws made sense. Since 1966, we've had the Big Bang cosmology. Um, the whole universe started very small, less than the size of a head of a pin. It's been expanding and cooling ever since, and as it grows and cools, new forms and structures appear within it. It's much more like a developing organism uh, than like an eternal machine. Um, so in this evolving universe that we live in, according to modern cosmology, uh, everything evolves. Uh, but they've still gone on with the idea that the laws of nature are fixed. And so they assume uh, that all the laws of nature were all there in place like a kind of Napoleonic code at the very moment of the Big Bang. They don't explain how they got there. Uh, many scientists are atheists, so they just assume there were these free-floating laws that were somehow there, or which came into being with the universe itself, together with all the matter and energy in the universe. And as my friend Terence McKenna liked to say, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. <laughs> and uh, one free miracle is the appearance of all the laws of nature and all the matter and energy in the universe from nothing in a single instant, for no reason. Um, anyway, we now have this radically evolving cosmos. And most scientists assume that all the laws were there at the beginning, and then they have endless debates about why were the laws exactly as they were and not otherwise. And then there's a huge debate in modern cosmology. One lot of people say, well, if they're exactly right for the universe that's just right for us, and there could have been billions of alternative universes, then there must have been an intelligent designer, a kind of external engineering god who fine-tuned all the laws and constants so it was just right for us before pressing the start button. And uh, that's one view, a kind of external mechanistic god. Um, the other view, to avoid an external mechanistic god, is to say there are billions of act trillions or quadrillions of actual universes. We just happen to live in the one that's right for us. And uh, all the others actually exist. Um, and when I asked one of the proponents of this, uh, that this very extravagant hypothesis contravening Occam's razor, that razor, the principle you should have the minimum number of entities in an explanation, I said this is the ultimate violation of Occam's razor. You know, quadrillions of universes for which there's not a shred of evidence. I said, why on earth can you, how on earth can you believe in that? He said, well, this way we can get rid of God. But uh, as, as theologians have pointed out, it doesn't even get rid of God because an infinite God would be the God of an infinite number of universes, or could be. So um, they, anyway, they're locked into this debate, the universe versus the multiverse, and seminars and conferences and learned discussions go on in universities about this, all based on the assumption the laws were fixed at the beginning. But if we're in a radically evolutionary universe, why should the laws be fixed at the beginning? Why shouldn't, if they're laws at all, why shouldn't they be more like common law in, in the English and American system, depending on precedents? Um, and um, in fact, why shouldn't they be more like habits? The minute you think about the idea of laws of nature, you realize that it's a deeply anthropomorphic concept. Only humans have laws and only civilized humans have laws. In fact, tribes have customs. Um, so the idea of laws of nature is, is a very peculiar idea, the more you think about it. Habits makes much more sense. And that's what I've been saying since I put forward the idea of morphic resonance in 1981 for the first time. Um, since then, cosmologists, including Lee Smolin, who's a theoretical physicist, have indeed started talking about the habits of nature and, and, and uh, they are coming round to this idea. But, I mean, they'll have to come round to it because it just doesn't make sense to have this hangover from the old Platonic cosmology sort of tacked on to uh, uh, an evolve, a radically evolutionary worldview.
Well, the, uh, this uh, way of looking at nature provides a very different interpretation of many physical phenomena. Um, for example, when you crystallize a new chemical for the very first time, according to the standard view, the way it forms is already predetermined by the laws of electromagnetism, quantum physics, thermodynamics, etc. And in principle, you should be able to predict the form of the crystal. In practice, you can't. It's too complicated. But in principle, you should. And the first time it forms, and the millionth time, and the billionth time, it should be exactly the same, because the laws are the same at all times and in all places. According to morphic resonance, the first time you make the crystal, uh, it may take a long time for the new crystal form to come into being. And when you make it repeatedly over and over again in labs all around the world, a habit, new habit builds up and the crystal should form, crystallize more easily. And that's exactly what chemists find. Crystals get easier and easier to crystallize. But of course they don't explain it in terms of morphic resonance, they explain it in terms of, firstly, anecdotes about chemists carrying seeds or nuclei, little bits of previous crystals around the world on their beards or clothing, and or secondly in terms of dust particles from previous crystals being wafted around the world in the atmosphere. Um, what I'm saying is that this should happen even when bearded chemists are excluded and when the dust is filtered from the atmosphere. And, um, and also this theory predicts the melting points of crystals, which are called physical constants, should go up as time goes on because the crystals get more stable through morphic resonance, the form becomes more habitual and therefore it should be harder to break the form down. You'd need a higher temperature to do it. And actually, the melting points of new compounds do go up, sometimes by 10, 20 degrees. I've studied this with hundreds of chemicals. And most chemists simply, uh, they have to acknowledge the fact that this is happening, even though these are supposed to be physical constants. Um, but they say, oh, it's just because we get better at making the crystals and, uh, and they're purer samples and purer samples have higher melting points. That, but it's incredibly difficult to get them to test this hypothesis. In it, I mean, it's already been tested through everyday practice of chemistry, but um, the facts fit very well with morphic resonance. In the realm of animal behavior, there's a well-known example of rats, a long series of experiments at Harvard, uh, Edinburgh and Melbourne University in Australia uh, showed that when you train rats to learn a new trick, escaping from a water maze, the more rats that learned it, the easier it got for other rats to learn it, even in other parts of the world. And this wasn't just rats that were descended from trained rats who might have inherited this epigenetically. Uh, but it was all rats of that breed, even ones whose parents had never been in a water maze before. Um, now, I think the same is happening in the human realm. I think it's getting easier to learn things other people have already learned. There's already lots of evidence for this. IQ tests, for example, have got at least 30%, uh, the, the scores on average scores on intelligence tests have got at least 30% higher over uh, the last decades so over throughout the 20th century, ever since they were invented in 1918. There's no independent evidence that people are getting smarter. Um, uh, if anything, they're not doing as well on other exams, you know, because of dumbing down, effects of TV, etc., low attention spans. Uh, I think they're getting, the IQ scores are going up because so many people have done the same tests, they get easier to do. And I would predict that Wordle should be getting easier to do throughout the day, from the moment it's published in the morning, uh, throughout the day, as it goes on, and every single day there's a new Wordle puzzle. And I would predict if you could get access to the data that there would be an increasing rate of score uh, throughout the day. I first got onto this through people writing and telling me in the 1980s that they find the Times crossword puzzle easier to do if they did it in the evening or the next day. Um, because, uh, and some people had noticed this anyway. Um, they left it till the evening to do it. It was more satisfying to be able to succeed with more clues. Um, and uh, so I think morphic resonance is working in these very practical things. When I thought of testing using Wordle as a test, uh, the very day I thought of it, uh, I wrote to the inventor of Wordle, but that very day it was bought by the New York Times. And so to, um, I tried to um, f get the New York Times to let me see the data, and uh, 
I thought cold calling the New York Times wasn't going to work. So um, one of Merlin's friends is an editor at the New York Times. So through Merlin's friend, I got access to the head of games at the New York Times and asked her if we could look at the data from the point of view of seeing if this was really happening. And she was a terrible spoil sport. She just wrote back saying, the games department are not interested in this project at this time. So unfortunately, they've got all this data and it's uh, can't get hands on it, but there's something called Quaddle and Octordle and what are the other ones, Chill? There's Dordle. Dordle, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, there's all these other versions of Wordle um, which um, may be more accessible for looking at the data. I'm going to try and get in touch with them when I get back to England. Um, so I think that the, 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 there have already been quite a number of experiments on learning, morphic resonance facilitated learning, um, and it should affect learning. It should be easier to learn things lots of people have learned, and the more that learn it, the easier it should get. And this should apply to skateboarding, snowboarding, windsurfing, you know, all these new physical skills as well as mental skills. Um, and when I talk to people in those areas of activity, Many of them say, yes, indeed, people are getting, it's getting easier to teach. But the trouble is you can't disentangle better equipment designs, training videos, etc., from morphic resonance. So it's hard to use that as evidence. One needs more uh, special situations. And Wordle would be really good for this. Um, so... Um, <coughs> This hypothesis is still controversial, and um, many scientists are scared of it, really, because it would overthrow so much of established science. I mean, actually, business as usual could still go on, because if a habit's strongly enough established, it behaves almost as if it's governed by an eternal law. The habits of hydrogen atoms, which have been going on for 13 billion years, are probably... Uh, you'd hardly tell the difference from an eternal law. But when something's new, that's when you notice the difference. And that's why to test morphic resonance, you have to look at new patterns of behavior, new forms of animals, new chemicals, new crystals, etc. Now, this has many implications uh, in different realms of science. And one is for, for inheritance in biology. Um, living organisms inherit a great deal from their ancestors. And the usual assumption is that this is genetic. Many people use the words hereditary and genetic as synonyms. If it's inherited, it must be in the DNA. DNA is a chemical molecule. And we know what DNA does. It enables cells to make proteins by spelling out the sequence of amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, which are strings of amino acids, which then fold up. But DNA spells out the sequence of amino acids in the primary string within a protein. Well, that's what it does. And some DNA controls the activity of other DNA, switches on and off genes. But that doesn't, making the right proteins doesn't uh, equate to the shape of your face or your arms or your legs. It just enables you to have the right proteins. Um, it's rather like saying um, having the right building materials would explain a house or a cabin. It doesn't. You have to have them to build the house or cabin, but the plan of the house, the architectural plan is not in the genes or in the building materials or in, in the DNA. And I think that it's uh, inherited through morphic resonance, through the forms of previous from the forms of previous organisms. When the Human Genome Project was completed in 2000, um, the assumption was that they'd soon be able to predict all details of human beings based on the genome, and that you could patent genes, and that you'd be able to predict exactly which diseases people would get with great accuracy, and so on. It turned out not to work out that way at all. The, um, soon after the human genome was sequenced, uh, there was the share price of these genome sequencing companies collapsed. Celera Genomics, the private genome company headed by Craig Venter, uh, collapsed from $64 a share to about 15 cents. And shortly afterwards, when, when interviewed, Craig Venter said, I'm a guy who's made a million the hard way by working my way down from a billion. And... Um, <laughs> and um, 
uh, and it turned out to be almost useless. And um, by 2008, it had become clear in, in biology that there was a major problem called the missing heritability problem. That um, you could, if you knew all the genes of a person, you could predict the likelihood of breast cancer or schizophrenia or something like that with an accuracy of less than 10%. With schizophrenia, it's about 3%. Um, uh, even for height, which is a fairly obvious physical characteristic, the, you can only explain about 10% in terms of genes. Um, so what's, where's all the rest of the inheritance coming from? And this is called, within biology, the missing heritability problem. Part of it, I think, is due to uh, epigenetics, which is the inheritance of acquired characters. Those of you who were at school or university in, in the 20th century will know that this was the biggest taboo in biology, the inheritance of acquired characters, the marking inheritance. I mean, it was really bad if anyone believed in that and there was sort of hissing noises and stuff. And it was just the worst heresy in biology. It's now mainstream. It definitely happens. It's been rebranded epigenetic inheritance and it's one of the hottest areas of biological research. Um, and I think quite a bit of it depends on morphic resonance. So the whole subject of heredity and evolution is now up for grabs in a way that didn't seem very likely in the 20th century when neo-Darwinism based on selfish genes was the dominant theory. There's now extended, the extended evolutionary synthesis, uh, which is a, a, a much broader theory of evolution that's not just based on genes but on epigenetics, on cultural inheritance, um, on the ability of organisms to modify their environment. Much broader and more inclusive theory than this narrow and rather shrill neo-Darwinism that, that many of us grew up with. And this is now mainstream, the extended evolutionary synthesis. There's papers in Nature on it, there's papers in Science and all the main journals, and it's basically what most people who are active in this field uh, uh, believe nowadays. Neo-Darwinism was a passing phase and a very narrow phase in the history of biology. One aspect of this is, is the study of identical twins. As all of you know, there used to be um, a lot of studies, and there still are, of identical twins separated soon after birth in order to find out how much of human nature depends on genetics and on the environment. And it turns out that identical twins separated soon after birth have a huge number of features in common, not just their physical appearance, but in the Minnesota's twin studies involving thousands of pairs of twins, um, uh, ridiculously detailed things like painting their houses the same colour, calling their kids by the same names, not the kinds of things even the most ardent neo-Darwinian would expect to be in, encoded in the genes. Um, and that was one reason why people thought genetics was, accounted for so much of inheritance from these identical twin studies. And the usual alternatives were environment or um, genes, and, or a mixture of both. Um, and so the, when it turns out there's all these enormous similarities, people say, well, it's primarily genes. And that was really the foundation of the whole edifice of selfish gene theory. Well, if morphic resonance is taking place, the very fact that they're identical, or at least very similar, means they'd specifically resonate with each other across space and time, even if they're living in separate places um, and in separate families, and there'd be a great deal of uh, connection between them and similarity. So what this evidence may suggest is uh, that morphic resonance is going on rather than it's all due to the genes. And when you think about similarity, if you ask yourself the question, who in the past is most similar to me now? The answer is you. You're most similar to yourself uh, in the past. I'm most similar to myself in the past. The most specific resonance acting on me is from my past. The most specific resonance acting on you is from your past. And I think that's why we retain our form, uh, because we resonate with our past forms, even though the proteins and the cells are continually changing, turning over. And I think it's how memories work. 
Now, the materialist conventional theory of memory is, of course, that all memories are stored inside the brain. Everything you remember is somewhere stored inside your head, either in a DNA molecule, a phosphorylated protein, or the favorite theory, modified nerve endings, synapses. Um, but despite a hundred years of trying to find uh, memory traces, they've proved elusive over and over and over again. But instead of scientists think, well, maybe they don't exist, they just say, well, we need billions more dollars to look even further and uh, to have even more detailed studies. And I think the reason they haven't found them is very simple. They're not there. Um, just as if I came to analyze your TV set to see what you'd watched last night and analyze the wires and transistors, I wouldn't find out what program you'd watched last night. It's not, it's not how it works. So um, I think that the um, uh, memories, I don't think, are stored in the brain. If you damage the brain, you can certainly affect memories. If you damage a TV set, you can affect the pictures or the sounds, but it doesn't prove they're all produced inside the TV set. It proves it's necessary for their processing, reception, etc. Now, <clears throat> memories, morphic resonance also applies to social groups, flocks of birds, schools of fish, termite colonies. A termite colony, um, the members of it can remember uh, from previous genera previous termite colonies how to do that architecture. Each individual termite is blind and uh, they, they move little bits of mud, put them in exactly the right place to produce these prodigious structures. Millions of termites can live in a single colony. They can build mounds that are 10 feet high uh, with complex tunnels and passageways and ventilation shafts and so on. How on earth does a tiny termite know where to put a little ball of mud? I think they're within a field, the, the, uh, the morphic field of the termite colony, and the individuals are responding to this field which has an inherent memory. Um, there's no way this can be programmed in proteins that they make in so just switching on or off genes uh, that make the right proteins. So I think social groups have uh, morphic resonance as well. And where this affects us, is that um, families are social groups and families have a kind of memory in the family field. And when we um, start new families, when people get married or live together and have children and start a new family, um, both the parents uh, have family fields. They bring with them a field from their family of origin. And the family is a kind of hybrid between these two family fields. And the, some families are more complicated, of course, with step-parents and so on. But to take the simplest case, you'd have two family fields, uh, both with a, a, a kind of history, uh, a pattern uh, formed in previous generations. And the kind of work that happens in family constellation therapy um, depends very much on these family fields. And I know more about this than some because Jill has been practicing this for many years, my wife Jill Purse, who's here, and has, uh, through her work and through the work of others, it becomes clear that the people's behavior is shaped by the family field, often by unconscious habitual patterns from previous generations, of which people are often completely unaware. And individuals within those families may behave in ways that individual psychotherapy can't really deal with. Because, for example, if in previous generations someone's been excluded from the family because they've committed suicide, committed a crime, done something shameful, or what, for whatever reason they've been excluded, then in a later generation one member of the family may unconsciously identify with the excluded person and exclude themselves by behaving in a dysfunctional way or becoming suicidal. Um, and individual psychotherapy just can't get to the bottom of this because it's not an individual problem. It's to do with something that's within the habitual field of the family. And family constellation therapy is extraordinarily effective in um, bringing to light these patterns and in this i can't describe it all now there isn't time but there are representatives for different members of the family selected from the group and those representatives someone who's standing in for the mother the father the brother the sister and so on often speak uh, when they're asked 
how they feel, um, often speak in a very appropriate way uh, about their situation in that family field, even though they don't know any, very much about the family at all. And they, they, it somehow comes through them as if they channel it from the field. There are now many people doing this work, and uh, but um, Joel has been doing it for years and has now developed an extraordinarily effective way of doing it online through perforce through COVID. Her first actual in-person one was for three years was here at Hollyhock last month, um, but she does them online. There's one coming up quite soon. Um, when Joel is it? Ninth of September. So, uh, they, it's amazing that these fields work on Zoom, even when the participants and the representatives can be hundreds of miles apart. I mean, I'm amazed it works, but it does. Um, that again, I think, is an example of morphic fields and morphic resonance working through them. Now, I want to deal with uh, two or three more examples here where morphic resonance touches our own lives. And one is through rituals. Um, all cultures and societies have rituals, and rituals involve reenacting uh, a story of origins. Not all rituals, some myths of origins um, and rituals of remembrance are about reenacting a story that, of the group's origin. And by reenacting it, people participate in it and affirm their identity. For example, for Jewish people, the festival of Passover is extremely important. And it reenacts the story of the original Passover. Jewish people were slaves in Egypt. There were a series of curses or plagues visited on the Egyptians to let, let them go. And the tenth one involved killing all the firstborn of the Egyptians and their cattle. And the Jewish people escaped this by smearing the blood of a, cow, um, a lamb on the uh, doorways of their houses. They were passed over. And for Jewish people, reenacting this story through the Passover feast or, or, or dinner is a key part of being Jewish and telling the story. So present day Jewish people and children are brought within this field of being Jewish through reenacting a ritual meal which re recreates that original meal. And rituals are highly conservative. They involve the right food, the right gestures, the right words. They have to be done in a very similar way to the way they've been done before. The Christian Holy Communion itself, a Passover dinner with Jesus and his disciples, re is reenacted in the Eucharist or the Mass in churches all over the world every Sunday, in fact, every day um, in many churches and cathedrals. And is, is again a reenacting of that original act, and it has to be done in the right way, the right gestures, the right ceremony, the right procedure. The American Thanksgiving dinner is an example of a secular or national ritual commemorating the survival of the first colonizers of the New World from, from England um, and, and from Europe. Um, and giving thanks for their surviving in the new world and reenacting that Thanksgiving dinner every year makes Americans and Canadians and the Canadian Thanksgiving uh, affirm their identity and their connection with all those who've done it before, right back to the first time. Now, there are countless rituals. All religions and societies have them. And they generally have this very conservative quality it has to be done the same way. And I think the reason that that works is that by doing it in the similar way as possible, the right chants, the right words, the gestures, etc., in the right liturgical language, Sanskrit is the language of Hindu rituals, Old Slavic of Russian Orthodox rituals, Ancient Egyptian of Coptic rituals in the Coptic Church in Egypt. These highly conservative use of ancient languages is because by doing it in the way it's been done before, you connect with those who've done it before you. That's the whole point of doing it. And if morphic resonance is happening, you see this is, uh, provides a very natural explanation for why rituals really do connect uh, participants with the ancestors, with those who've gone before, why there really is a presence of the past uh, through these rituals. The same principles apply on the smaller scale to mantras, which are sacred phrases or words uh, which are used in, in meditation and in, in rituals and in prayers. Um, or, uh, and mantras are not st meaningful statements usually. They're not necessarily words that tell you some information. 
The whole point of the mantra is that by chanting the mantra, uh, you resonate, your body physically resonates. If you're doing it with other people, you resonate with other people by chanting together because you're doing it at the same time and you're in resonance with others. And you resonate with all those who've done that mantra before. And again, this is something I've learned a lot about from Jill, who in her sound workshops, sound and voice workshops, um, teaches the very principles of mantra and you get to experience them um, directly. So again, this fits very well with the idea of morphic resonance. It would be hard to understand the power of mantras without something like morphic resonance. Similar principles also apply to holy places. And one of the things that I do in England is that I help with the um, work of something called the British Pilgrimage Trust, which I helped found, um, which is opening footpath pilgrimages to the holy places of England, including cathedrals, churches, holy wells, ancient trees, stone circles, and other holy places. And these are footpath pilgrimages you walk on foot. Um, there's a big revival of pilgrimage going on all over Europe at the moment. The, the, uh, the iconic pilgrimages to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Um, in 1987, when it, the first of the sort of modern version of the pilgrimage got going, a thousand people walked it. In 2019, 330,000 people walked it. There's been a huge increase in pilgrimage in Europe. And not only from people who are devout Catholics or religious people. In the British Pilgrimage Trust, when we have organised pilgrimages that people can join in, they, groups can go together, one of the slogans for the, uh, these pilgrimages, BYOB, bring your own beliefs. Um, and so um, this, when people go to holy places, say you go to one of our great Gothic medieval cathedrals, um, whatever your belief system, these have an enormously powerful effect on most people. They were built to change consciousness. They're vast structures designed to expand your mind. The stained glass windows have a kind of psychedelic quality. And in the Middle Ages, when people lived in drab grey huts and things, this must have been even more powerful than it is today. Um, and one reason that sacred places have this power, I think, is that when you enter them, you come into resonance with other people who've been in that place before. And if they've had visionary or inspiring experiences there, or many have prayed there, or given thanks there, um, then that's part of your experience. You tune into that, and these places have a particular power, uh, which I think depends on morphic resonance from those who've been there before. And of course, you can have places where bad things have happened, like battlefields, where there can be a very negative feeling. And that, again, would be a morphic resonance with the negative emotions of those who've been there before. And then in the form of festivals, seasonal festivals, we have another collective form of celebration, which is found all over the world in all cultures, um, where um, people celebrate together um, it's one of the ways in which societies and families acquire cohesion through celebrating together. Um, it's it, that collective celebration is essential, for, really, for building positive communities. And seasonal festivals have always done this in all cultures, and and we still have them, even in very secular countries like modern Britain. I mean, Christmas is still a hugely important seasonal festival even for people who are not religious believers, um, and Easter. And uh, all cultures have their seasonal festivals. And again, you have the same morphic resonance properties. That, you know, Christmas has Christmas carols, Christmas trees, you know, Santa Claus, snow, snowman song, and jingle bells, all that kind of thing, uh, which all sound hopelessly out of place if you hear them in a bright summer's day. Uh, but because they're appropriate to that season, and. Uh, the, the, the falls in that season, there's this resonance with those who've taken part before. So I think all of us come within that field of resonance. And as spiritual practices, what they do is connect us. Spiritual practices are about connection. Um, um, meditation is about connection to a deeper source of consciousness. Um, the spiritual practices of rituals connect you with others who are doing the ritual and connect you with the ancestors and those who've done them before and with the primal transcendent event which is some special event to 
divinely inspired event which they're commemorating. Um, so they're all about connection. And seasonal festivals have this quality too. One of the great periods of seasonal festivals in Britain and all over Europe was Midsummer's Day, which is June the 24th, just after the solstice, just as Christmas is just after the winter solstice. Midsummer's Day is just after the summer solstice. And um, it's interesting that the Glastonbury Festival, the, the biggest music festival in England, the most iconic of all our summer festivals, um, happens over Midsummer's Day. And it's, uh, Midsummer's Day is the feast of St John the Baptist, and Pilton, the village where the Glastonbury Festival happens, is uh, the patron saint of Pilton happens to be St John the Baptist. And I once went to a service on a Sunday in the Glastonbury Festival. I was staying, I was at the festival, but I, I make a practice of going to church on Sundays wherever I am. And so I went to the ancient parish church of Pilton, and there was the festival in the background. And I said to the vicar, the priest, uh, I said, you've got the biggest patronal festival of any village in England. And he just looked a bit puzzled, and then he realised what I was saying, and he sort of chuckled. And yes, indeed, uh, this is a very ancient tradition. And here on Cortez, we've uh, had a, a newly... Uh, in, in a new revival of that kind of tradition in the Love Fest or Summer of Love, which those of you who live on the island may have been to uh, recently, um, is again a, a revival of this kind of principle of seasonal festival and joint and collective celebration with music and dancing and, and, and happy celebration. So these are some of the ways in which I think morphic resonance touches our own lives. It underlies our growth, our development, our memories, our collective life, our festivals, rituals, um, celebrations. Um, and, and I think morphic resonance is, uh, as I was saying before, inherent in all of nature. Um, we experience its human forms and its cultural forms. Uh, but I think it applies to all self-organizing systems in nature. Um, not everything in nature is self-organizing. Um, it may be worth spelling out what is. Um, um, atoms are self-organizing. They make themselves. And molecules and the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, oxygen molecules, nitrogen molecules, they're not made in factories. They're self-organizing. Uh, planets are self-organizing, stars are self-organizing, galaxies are self-organizing, animals and plants are self-organizing, crystals are self-organizing, termite societies are self-organizing. But chairs are not self-organizing, they're made in factories. Tables aren't self-organizing. Mm -hmm. Rocks are not self-organizing, because although the crystals within them are, if a big rock falls down a mountain and sp splinters into lots of little bits, um, They've, those little bits have arisen because of external forces, not because that's how the rock grows. Um, um, so, and computers are not self-organizing, they're made in factories. Uh, computer programs are not self-organizing, they're programmed by computer programmers. So none of these systems would have morphic resonance, chairs, tables, computers, and so on. Um, and that's one reason I think that artificial intelligence is very unlikely to be truly intelligent, because it's programmed into computers which are mechanistic, machine-like systems, which are deterministic, um, which don't have that capacity to self-organize and therefore to have a kind of memory. You have to build in a solid-state memory into disks or magnetic tapes or whatever in computers. Um, if we had a truly living technology, you know, it would never be a digital computer, I think, but possibly analog computers, possibly quantum computers, if they get to a state where they have a holistic property which really is self-organizing, then they may have their own memory by morphic resonance and they may connect up with other similar computers all around the world in a kind of collective memory. A new technology could possibly emerge in the artificial intelligence computer world, but not with digital computers, um, uh, possibly with analog or quantum computers. Um, so by recognizing what's self-organizing and what isn't, um, it makes it easier to understand what things may have their own memory. And 
in the modern philosophy of panpsychism, the idea of mind in all things, in atoms, molecules, crystals, stars, galaxies, this is becoming surprisingly fashionable in the academic world at the moment. Um, again, this would apply only to self-organizing systems, not to tables, chairs, computers and socks. Um, I mean, this is a common repost of skeptics when people say they're panpsychists. They say, you mean my socks are conscious? Uh, no, that's not what they're saying, and I'm not saying they have morphic resonance. Um, I, but um, so I think self-organizing things throughout nature, things which are basically alive, animate, or self-organizing, um, have this kind of memory. And the entire universe is self-organizing, so the whole universe would have a kind of cosmic memory. Now finally, um, although morphic resonance helps to explain many aspects of nature, what it explains is uh, repetition um, and the maintenance of things. If, you like, if you're familiar with the Hindu pantheon, pantheon of, Vi of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, Brahma is the sort of creator, Vishnu is the preserver, who keeps the order of the universe, and Shiva is the creator who creates and destroys, and is the creative principle. Well, morphic resonance is more the Vishnu principle, it's the principle of preservation of form and order. It's a conservative principle, because it enables patterns to be repeated, orders to be sustained. But it doesn't explain creativity, it doesn't explain where new forms come from, a new order appears. So within the universe, within evolution, there has to be a creative principle as well. Um, and that's another, st uh, another story. I'm not going to talk about that now because there isn't time and it's a huge topic. Uh, but evolution has to in involve an interplay of habit and creativity. If there were any habit, there would be repetition and only repetition. If there were any creativity, there would be a constant display of novelty, but nothing would ever stabilize. There'd be a kind of chaos. Um, and what we have is an interplay between these two, both in the entire cosmos and in our own lives. So those are a few words about morphic resonance and how it affects our lives, and um, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. There's, uh, there's at some time for Q&A, and I've asked Aiton to pick the questioners, so I don't, because I can't see everyone very well, especially people at the back, and he's got a roving microphone. And I'm passing the hat now. Martha, get that started for me. Thank you. Um, Erica. But before Erica, I wanted to ask a question. <laughs> I'm first in line. Um, there, there are, are uh, many people who postulate that the trance state is a fundamental need of, of humans. And I was just wondering if you could talk about the relationship uh, between trance states and morphic resonance. You mean as in um, sort of dance-induced dance trances and drug-induced trances and so on? Um, well, I think those, as states of consciousness, they'd have their own field and organizing principles. And I think that those would also have a kind of morphic field. I, for example, I think that psychedelic experiences, um, when you take a particular psychedelic, then the pattern of change in your own brain and mind would resonate with that of other people who've taken the same psychedelic in the past. So if you have a psychedelic like ayahuasca, which has been taken in tribal societies in the Amazon with mythologies about jaguars and serpents and so on, if people who know nothing about Amazon mythologies take ayahuasca in modern urban settings, uh, then some of them may see jaguars and serpents, and indeed some do. Uh, I think that this is uh, not because the molecules of ayahuasca trigger jaguar mo molecules in the brain, but because they tune you in uh, to those who've done it before. Now, it doesn't explain how trance states originate in the first place, because morphic resonance, as I said, doesn't explain creativity. But it does explain how, when you're in a particular kind of trance state, you'd resonate with others who've been in a similar state. So there'd be a transpersonal aspect to them.
Hello. Um, I'm curious, and this uh, question isn't fully formed, but um, I'm curious about uh, like relations who've passed, and if you can, um, in the present, resonate with them, not in the past, but in the present. Resonate with what in, the, in the with with like uh, relations who have passed, and so not not resonating to what they were, but what they are. Well, I mean, morphic resonance is usually from the past to the present, but you could say that if something's a millisecond in the past, it would be almost the same as in the present, and I think that something like that underlies telepathy, um, which is a kind of resonance between people in the present. Um, it's different from memory because it is more or less in the present and the whole point of telepathy it tells you what's going on for other people now um, but so it's not exactly the same as morphic resonance but it's closely related it means ancestors. well ancestors would I, as I mentioned in the in the field uh, the, the ancestral field um, the ancestors influences continually both directly through resonance with us personally. Um, individual ancestors may, uh, our parents and our grandparents and other ancestors may influence us directly by resonance. But then the ancestral families, all the, not just the individuals, but the way they related to each other within our parents' family, our grandparents' family, our great-grandparents' family, those then would resonate with our families in the present, but individuals would resonate with us as individuals. So you have both the individual and the family resonances working on us in the present. So I think we're greatly influenced by um, ancestors and the past. And sometimes people have skills or abilities or interests which are very similar to those of grandparents or something, even if they never knew their grandparents had these interests. So I think this is very much part of our nature. Part of our heredity is this resonance with the past and our ancestors. Genes are part of it, but as I said, there's much more to it than just genes. I'm, I'm curious, though, I see that sort of past um, connection, but I'm curious if, um, if you can resonate with... Um, you know, or what you're saying, sort of telepathy with uh, an ancestor who has passed sort of currently rather than what they were, but sort of... Oh, you mean if in their, they're in the afterlife and you're resonating with them? No. Well, that's a much more complicated question because it depends on what form we survive in. And, and, and one thing that is relevant to this that I should have pointed out or could have pointed out is that if memories are not stored in our brains then they're not all destroyed at death. Um, the usual materialist assumption is that our, all our memories are inside our heads and our brains, and everyone agrees the brain decays after death. And so for materialists, all memories are wiped out totally. Um, therefore, there's no possibility of survival of bodily death in any form whatever. Um, this is one reason that materialists are atheists and that atheists are materialists, because it refutes all religions, because they all have some belief in survival of death. Um, now, whether in what kind of state our ancestors go on existing is another question. And the popular Catholic vision of this is beautifully embodied in that Disney film Coco, which about the Mexican Day of the Dead, where people relate to the ancestors. And I myself think it's important to relate to the ancestors on November the 2nd, All Souls Day, um, and I always um, do some kind of ceremony for my ancestors. Most Catholic and Anglican churches have services for All Souls Day. And <clears throat> Chill um, use, does workshops over All Souls Day, um, and they include a requiem mass at our parish church in Hampstead, which our priest conducts. Um, and the people in her workshops are you know, relating to their ancestors through that. Many of them would never normally go to church. Some are Jewish, some are atheists, etc. But it's very meaningful in the, the context Jill sets of where you're relating to those who've gone before. Um, so these are traditional ways of doing it. Um, 
So is that why if we heal ourselves in this lifetime of something through Jill's work or something like that, then we also can heal backwards and forwards because of is morphic resonance something that would explain that phenomena that people feel is possible? Like this um, stopping the cycle of abuse in your lifetime and, and healing backwards generations and forward generations. Well, that would be the kind of thing that I would expect, but it would be hard, hard to prove that... It, I mean, if the family field is healed through these practices, then I would expect it to affect people thereafter. Um, to what degree it acts retroactively, you know, whether the actual ancestors a hundred years ago uh, are through time travel from Jill's workshops <laughs> affected by what's happening in the workshop, no, we can't test that really, but whether the ancestors in the afterlife, whatever form it takes for them, are affected, that seems to me perfectly possible, but th that can only be speculative. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for sharing these views. It's just fascinating. Uh, my question um, is: Do you hope that that this uh, the resonance is quantifiable? And if so, where would you look? Well, you study you'd study it through its effects. All it works through fields, morphic fields, and. In science, you study fields through their effects. You know, study gravitational fields through gravitational effects, electric fields through electric effects, and so on. And you, the resonance uh, of morphic resonance, you'd study through its effects. So if, for example, you train a rat to learn a new trick, then you can see whether a rat a thousand miles away learns it quicker. And uh, then if you train a thousand rats, say on Cortes Island, to learn a new trick, would rats uh, 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 far away learn it much quicker than if one had done it here? And the evidence suggests they do. So the bigger the influence, the bigger the effect. And so you can actually study it through its effects. Um, and uh, at, the, at present, the experiments, are not, uh, so far what they seem to show is that the bigger the number of individuals, the greater the effect. But there also may be an intensity factor. People who learn things that involve very intense learning program may have a greater effect than people who just superficially learn something. So all of these are empirically empirical questions, really. So you study it through the effects. You wouldn't expect to be able to study it through some electrical meter that you hold up in the air, because you can't even study gravitation through an electrical meter. You can study electricity and magnetism through electric meters, but not gravitation or quantum fields. Um, so you have to study things through their own appropriate effects. Uh, I had, hi Rupert, I had a, a thought when you were talking about, yes, we're designed to be both habitual and creative. And I think you said uh, morphic resonance doesn't really explain creativity. Um, the thought I had is, because in psychotherapy, you know, with family constellations, Hakomi, which is what I'm trained in, I love to normalize the, the fact that we're habitual. And it feels, it seems to me that the bridge to creativity is consciousness. Well, I agree. I, I think uh, certainly in our own case, the bridge to creativity is consciousness. Although when people have a creative insight it comes through consciousness rather than from it you know people would say it came to me in a flash or it came to me in a dream or something like that so consciousness may be the medium through which we get it but not necessarily through which we make it and traditional views of creativity and in the greek world for example are that the muses there are creative spirits that uh, work through us. That's why music is called music. The mu muse of music works through musicians. And that's why you have museums where the human arts, all governed by the muses, are collected together. Um, in India, if you go to a classical music concert in South India, 
it will start with an invocation to the goddess of music, Saraswati, uh, to inspire the performers and the musicians. And in the Christian tradition, the angels, which are creative spirits, um, and the Holy Spirit itself work through us. So creativity traditionally is understood in the human realm through inspiration, the breathing in of the spirit, of the creative spirit, from beyond us and through us. And it's mediated through our consciousness, but not originating within it. Um, and of course, these are speculations, but um, when most creative people talk about the creative process, they usually say they don't know where it came from. It came in a flash, that kind of thing. It came, as it were, from outside, coming through them. fun thought when we were talking about um, how it shows up in the way people learn things. You know, golfers are so much better now than they were. Even the ones who are golfing now and winning, they're so much better than Tiger Woods even was. And wouldn't it be fun to get some of these awesome golfers to play with old equipment and and I think what would be demonstrated is they're still hitting the ball farther than Tiger Woods was. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, um, yes, I, I mean, in, in most sports, there's been uh, a, a, an improvement in skills, and that's a very good experimental test to use the older equipment and see if they're still good at it. Yeah. Um. Oh. Um, I know we're talking about memory and stuff, but I'm wondering if there's if there's a way to resonate with future happenings. I'm interested in like kind of prophetic dreams and visions and stuff, and if we can tap into things from the in the future. I think we can, but I don't think that's through morphic resonance. Morphic resonance is mainly about habits, and the more habitual something is, the more unconscious it is. Um, I think that we are open to the future in ways that are more related to the kind of creative aspects of consciousness. Um, there's no, I think there's no doubt that precognitive dreams occur. People have premonitions, people have dreams about events in the future. Not all the time. Um, 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 animals can feel the future too. I mean, the warnings of earthquakes and tsunamis by dogs, cats and many kinds of wild animals um, suggest that they're able to feel what's about to happen. And there's a phenomenon called presentiment, uh, where humans can feel what's about to happen a few seconds in advance. This is something that parapsychologists like Dean Radin have studied, I think, very convincingly. So I think that we are open to the future, not all the time, not as reliably as we're open to the past. These presentiments don't work as reliably as memory does. Um, uh, but they definitely seem to happen. No one knows quite how or why. And there's all sorts of speculative theories, but uh, it's really not understood how it works. But I'm sure it happens. I myself have studied in my book the sense of being stared at and other aspects of the extended mind. I discuss human presentiments, precognitive dreams, and this openness to the future. In, in my book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home and Other Unexplained Powers of Animals, I discuss earthquake warning by animals and tsunami warnings, air raid warnings and that kind of thing. Um, epileptic seizure dogs that give warnings of seizures and so on. So I think this ability is deep in our biological nature. It's not specifically human. But if you stand under that tree, you can be Newton. <laughs> yes. Well, we've got a perfect demonstration of gravitation going on here. <laughs> oh, heavens! We've got a visit from the stag. Come for the food, stay for the talk. Yes. <laughs> so well, we're running late, a bit late now. Should sure we have just one more? Another question? Oh, I hope it's a good one. Hi, Rupert. Um, Hello. My question is whether morphic resonance could be interrupted or disrupted at all. 
Well, I don't think it can be sort of screened out by a Faraday cage or anything like that, uh, but it can be competed with. I mean, you can have competing resonances. Um, for example, if you make a hybrid between two species, like a mule is a hybrid between a horse and a donkey, then you get both influences working. And not all the horse influences would come through, not all the donkey influences, but you'd have a kind of mixture of them. Um, if you have, um, in genetics, I think the reason most mutations and most new forms of organisms are recessive is because they're rare, they're new things that haven't happened very much. And if you cross a mutant with a recessive, what's called a recessive gene, I don't think it's really the gene that's recessive. I think the fact, the fact that it's only happened a little bit before is what makes it recessive. Cross it with the so-called wild type, then you'll no longer see this rare recessive characteristic. The, the morphic resonance from it will be swamped by the more powerful regular resonance. Um, so the, the, the morphic resonance, the, the influence on the given organism or system from the past is from countless other systems. And um, if you want to neutralize one particular thing, then it can be overwhelmed by other ones. Or uh, you can change the tuning, so you tune into a different one. Like on a TV set, they, all those channels are broadcasting, and change the tuning knob and you change the tuning to a different channel. And that happens in developmental biology. Sometimes you can change in fruit flies, for example. The f there's a pair of wings, and the second se the segment behind it has halt hairs or balancing organs. And there's a mutation called bithorax that changes the tuning of those so that the halt hairs develop into another pair of wings. So you get a four-winged fly instead of a two-winged fly. And so there you've changed the resonance by switching the tuning to another channel. So you, can, you can't exactly block it, but you can change the tuning or you can compete with it by other resonances that overwhelm it. Good. Well, I think, um, Aiton, I think maybe that's... Charles wanted to... Oh, yes, Charles. Well, you, you've, been, you've been talking about uh, the cosmology and the universes, and I'm just wondering if the pictures from the Webb telescope have interested you or stimulated you in these thoughts? The new pictures of, of the universes, the billions of them. I haven't actually seen them yet, uh, the new pictures from the Webb telescope, but I, I will do when I uh, have the chance. So I don't know that they change my actual view of what's going on fundamentally. I mean, more and more galaxies, more and more stars, more detailed pictures of planets, all that kind of thing, is important, but it doesn't change the basic fundamental <laughs> principles um, of gravity. <laughs> um, the, um, so, I, you know, the kinds of questions that are interest me are to what degree are these galaxies conscious and to what degree is the sun conscious? And for those of you who are interested in these things, I published a paper recently in the Journal of Consciousness Studies called Is the Sun Conscious? to which I answer probably yes. Um, the, as we think about consciousness in the universe, as we go beyond the cerebrocentric view of consciousness, it's just in brains, um, we can then recognize that many things could be conscious in the universe. Our ancestors thought that. I mean, for, for the Greeks, all the stars and planets were living beings with their own minds. So Plato called the planets and the stars the living gods, the visible gods. Um, we can see them. Um, and yet they have minds and powers greater than our own. And so um, I think as we recover a sort of panpsychist sense of the universe or animistic sense of the universe, then we can see what we see through the Webb telescope or any other telescope or the Hubble telescope or whatever. Um, we can interpret them in a, in a different way. The actual image is neutral in the sense it doesn't tell us whether it's conscious or not, and the usual assumption of astronomers is this is just dead matter out there. Um, but I, I think we can see it in a, in a completely different way, in a way that may be more realistic, actually, that we live.